Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at how orbital effects impact SN2 reactions, specifically how it enhances SN2 reactions. We're going to be looking at how allylic substrates, and even those next to carbonyls, receive an, a rate enhancement thanks to a secondary orbital overlap, which impacts the reaction kinetics. Let's go ahead and get started. So as I'm sure most of you are aware by now, the SN2 reaction proceeds through a trigonal bipyramidal transition state, which we can see here on the left-hand side. This transition state is both polarized, i.e. that it has negative charges on the nucleophile and the leaving group, and associative. That is to say, both the nucleophile and leaving group have partial bonds to the carbon at this time, meaning that an orbital is extending from one to the other. Now, when we think of allylic substrates, right, things that are adjacent to a double bond, typically we think of an SN1 pathway, right? We create a resonance stabilized carbocation that's good, that favors SN1. However, what if we use SN2 forcing conditions on a primary substrate? What if we use a really strong nucleophile, something like cyanide or a thiolate, and we have an aprotic solvent like DMSO? Well, in that case, we can actually force an SN2 reaction What's interesting though, is that the SN2 is faster than a normal SN2. Why is that the case? Well, it boils down to the transition state. So if we look at the orbital picture for a uh, nucleophilic transition state with an allylic bond, we see that the orbitals from the nucleophile and leaving group to this carbon, this associative transition state, is actually aligned with the pi orbitals from the double bond. The reason is that this transition state has a planar configuration at this carbon similar to the planar configuration you see in pi bonds. And so all of the orbitals are aligned with one another. What this means is that there's going to be an overlap and a sort of hyperconjugation between the pi orbitals and the transition state. Anytime you can delocalize electron density, you stabilize whatever condition the molecule is in. So in this case, being able to delocalize electron density in this transition state towards this pi orbital stabilizes the transition state and increases the rate of reaction since transition state stability is directly related to reaction rate. Right? So just to summarize, there's a secondary orbital overlap between the pi orbitals and the transition state orbitals, which causes hyperconjugation, stabilizing the transition state and enhancing our reaction rate. I also want to go ahead and address a more niche example, which happens with carbonyls. As we talked about in the carbocation stability video, carbonyls tend to disfavor SN1 at the alpha position. So if you have a tertiary leaving group, you might think that favors SN1. However, if you have a carbonyl next door, the inductive effect of the carbonyl, as well as the dipolar resonance structure created by the carbonyl, leads to a destabilization of this cation. Right? This resonance structure here, which has a positive charge next to another positive charge, is extremely unstable. Therefore, this cation is disfavored, and the SN1 process is hindered. Right? So the inductive effect of carbonyls tends to disfavor cation formation. However, in SN2, we don't have a cation, but we do have the adjacent double bond. So that secondary orbital effect still holds, and we actually get a enhancement of SN2 adjacent to a carbonyl, right? If we look at the orbital picture, it looks exactly the same as it did for the regular allylic substrate. The pi bonds in the carbonyl can overlap with that transition state, giving us that hyperconjugation without creating the destabilization of the carbocation. And so if we have a species that is alpha to a carbonyl, like this chlorine here, the SN2 process actually is favored. And this is a way where if you are able to uh, get a species where you have a carbonyl next to this, you can selectively perform SN2 on it without ever having to worry about SN1 because the carbonyl is destabilizing and deselects uh, for the SN1 process, right? So synthetically, that is something that might be useful to you in case um, you are ever trying to selectively perform SN2 to get a certain stereochemistry on a center. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. If you want to learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlist. And if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. Thank you so much for watching and see you next time.